Authenticity seems to be a peculiarly modern obsession, but it's an obsession that's actually been quite a, quite a while in the making. Uh, this is really because the modernization process, the evolution of us as moderns, the societies that have created us and given us our modern perspective on life, um, has really been an unfolding process over a couple of centuries. And so we can understand uh, the particular, in a sense, fattiness of the discourse of uh, authenticity these days in both branding and in discussions of consumer culture uh, as uh, having emerged out of both philosophical reflections and popular thinking, feeling, reacting to the gradual rise of the individual who is responsible for making their own way in the world at large, um, rather than in the past where people's roles, values and whatnot were overwhelmingly determined by their social circumstances. So there is uh, a mass of publications out there on authenticity, uh, uh, plenty to keep you going if you wanted to write a doctoral thesis on the subject, but you've actually or would have a lot of competition because so many, so many books have been written and many more coming out as well. Um, one of the interesting things is that uh, authenticity appears in, in various subsections of discussion of culture. So obviously we see in books such as the one shown here, um, culture and authenticity, cultural uh, studies scholars and others think in general about um, this notion of authenticity and why it's become, become so prominent in our culture. But we also see that within particular fields such as musicology, uh, discussions about what constitutes authenticity. Is there any meaningful notion of this? We can think about uh, why in the world of art and music there is a concern with authenticity. Uh, of course, the compositions or artworks by uh, renowned people uh, periodically being rediscovered. And so there's always this question of the provenance of the uh, originality, the authenticity of, uh, of a work. But then, for example, if you take a musical score and then perform it with um, modern instruments versus um, what they call period instruments, so antique instruments, uh, is it more or less an uh, authentic performance, given that we will never fully know the uh, composer's intent? And of course, audiences themselves are in a very different milieu, cultural milieu, and they will bring different perceptions and reactions themselves to a performance. But anyway, there is a lot of discussion of authenticity, whether it's a meaningful notion, but also significantly a recognition that audiences, paying audiences and collectors have long been concerned with authenticity. And so therefore, it's quite meaningful to speak, as one book title does there, uh, about uh, the conscious forging of authenticity. Now, when we turn to business and business communications and branding, as we're particularly interested in in this course, we can see that there's a huge number of publications, presentations, commentary, journalistic works uh, out there. Just I've, I've picked up a few here. Um, notably, uh, a book by James Gilmore and Joseph Pine on uh, authenticity. We have a link on the course website to a uh, presentation given back in about 2006 uh, by Joseph uh, Pine talking about authenticity and why it is significant for, in terms of um, consumer values. But he also makes the uh, interesting point that uh, uh, some clearly inauthentic experiences insofar as they are designed um, such as say Disneyland uh, are nonetheless very recognizable for what they are for example as a distinctive Disney experience so he speaks uh, directly of authentic fake in the light uh, in, in relation to Disney for example. Uh, another author who really built a reputation uh, as a commentator on marketing and branding matters Seth Godin uh, in an influential book from about 15 years ago, uh, spoke about how the power of telling authentic stories in a low trust world was going to uh, become ever more important. Um, 
that was just the start. We're seeing a whole boom on books that uh, speak to issues of authenticity in various aspects of business, whether it's the workplace, for example, or whether it's more academic studies that talk about um, authenticity in branded consumer culture. Um, there's one book in the middle here, actually, um, talks about perceived authenticity even in prostitution. Um, so academics are uh, looking more generally at how and under what circumstances people might suspend disbelief, um, or want, to, want to believe that something which is clearly brazenly transactional, um, it might be something more than that and actually meaningful. Uh, the context of tourism too, authenticity becomes interesting because so many tourists want to have ostensibly authentic cultural experiences, but the, uh, the mass presence of tourists themselves uh, can significantly impact on culture and of course create commercial um, incentives to package culture in a way that might be quite inauthentic. And uh, one final work here on this particular slide, um, your authenticity is your trademark. I haven't read the book, and I'm not about to read the book either, but the, uh, the pitch from the author was that um, through a combination of insights from yoga, brain science, and brain science, um, then executives and entrepreneurs uh, can be empowered as effective leaders and thinkers. Okay. Now, if we look around, uh, we will see just how faddy the discourse of, discourse of authenticity is, and it's very often packaged with some other trending terms, which we uh, will note here, but we'll finish up with as well. Uh, this is uh, uh, something I uh, saw in London, caught my eye, because it was so uh, faddy. So it says here, a space dedicated to enriching experiences, curated design, and authentic stories. Doesn't just want to make you go in and spend some money. Okay. So, yes, I, I think we can definitely say we are in the midst of an authenticity fad, um, but it is clearly something deeper too. And possible factors for it being a, a deeper thing, well, clearly the, uh, there are intellectual trends since the early 19th century which have uh, lent weight legitimacy to concerns about authenticity, personal authenticity in particular. Uh, arguably, plenitude, the sheer abundance of choice that we have, uh, is a factor. Long supply chains, that uh, more and more offshoring, being uh, able to get things uh, from all around the world, um, raises interesting questions about the relationship of uh, product, culture, uh, and place and identity and whatnot. And uh, when, we, when we think, for example, of uh, an elementary example such as uh, sushi and Japanese cuisine, it's such, so, so, so much associated with um, Japan and, and, and Japanness. Um, and yet, sushi, particularly Maguro, has some of the longest supply chains in the world. So, tuna come from all around the world, um, but given a particularly uh, distinctive Japanese treatment, um, or it may be Japanese chefs who get um, tuna from one part of the world, they may actually secure it through the Tokyo fish market, but then they may run a, uh, a premium sushi restaurant in Sydney, for example. Um, and then there are these perceptions of, well, what, what makes something authentically Japanese? And uh, uh, these are the kind of issues we'll kick around in class, have, have a conversation about. Uh, Another fundamental factor here, and we'll see in some of the book titles, is that the sheer ubiquity of branding, with everybody telling stories these days, uh, means that invariably this is going to raise questions about, well, how authentic are a lot of these stories that, that uh, we're being constantly being exposed to? And then I think there's some really deeper issues here of individual agency in our modern societies and the anxieties it brings. So on that, Choice anxiety, uh, arguably that there is a, a broader anxiety about our personal efficacy uh, because we have so many choices to make. Uh, I think many people fear that, or, that they uh, might be a sucker, that they might be taken advantage of, that they might be ripped off, okay? Um, 
Now, this is obviously not a, not a new thing. People have always worried about that. Uh, the old Latin expression, caveat emptor, buyer beware, means that for a couple of thousand years at least, people have been uh, conscious that the, uh, the onus is on the buyer um, to not be conned by the, uh, the seller. Um, and yet, arguably, the sheer enormity of our uh, potential choices as consumers these days, there is so much available to us. Um, from all over the world, through so many different channels. So invariably there are going to be questions about where do we get our tastes from, how do we make particular decisions, and how do we navigate all of these different stories that we're being told. Um, within the cultural industries as well too, uh, we can think of choice and uh, how we invariably are so overwhelmed with choice that we have to rely on curators, influencers, for example, um, crowdsourced um, wisdom, uh, or traditionally the role of the, uh, the reviewer or the critic, for example. Richard Caves, in his very famous book on creative industries, talks about um, cultural consumption capital. And his notion there is that the more you consume, the more you develop your tastes, and you're more capable of actually making judgments and becoming more discerning. And I think that's a very powerful concept. But he also explicitly recognized that our capacity to do so is limited. And so it's quite rational for us to rely on the good taste, the expertise of others for much of our consumption, and then our particular passions we pursue ourselves. And um, so in a sec in effect, we might be uh, making recommendations to each other based on our own particular kind of maniac tendencies to throw ourselves into um, whatever we're into um, in, in an intensive way um, and also be consuming on an extensive basis and taking advantage of all those, those other people um, who have a particular passion for whatever it is they might that um, um, we are interested in but don't have a capacity to do a deep dive into. But I think beyond the uh, cultural choices we make, the lifestyle choices, the, uh, the consumer choices we make, there is something more fundamental too in terms of uh, our potential anxiety about our personal efficacy. Um, and that is, we really are the architects of our own des destiny these days. Um, most people decide what they study at university themselves. Their parents don't force them to do it. Hopefully they pay, um, or the state pays, or whatever, depending on where you're, uh, where you're studying in Japan, uh, at Waseda or Sofia. Someone's got to pay. Parents are going to pay, mostly. Okay. Um, but then, you know, who you marry, what job you do, uh, what you become, where you live, all of these things that historically would have been largely decided for you by your social circumstances and your family are pretty much down to yourself these days, which means there's great freedom. But with freedom comes uh, a degree of angst, as some of the existentialists referred to. Uh, we see Martin Heidegger, and we'll see them, and Jean-Paul Sartre, for example, both spoke in terms of this ang anxiety, this angoise, or ang um, angst, uh, about um, how you actually make yourself um, create your own identity, um, choose your own life path, deeply socially situated, deeply influenced, invariably to a, to a substantial degree, um, situated uh, through no choice of your own at a certain start point, but nonetheless having the latitude to make something very different and maybe very consciously to deliberately to step out, your, out of your own sources of socialization um, explicitly to grow your own hor uh, horizons. That's what we actually do when uh, we do things like choosing to go and live abroad or to study in a foreign language um, or to, to have a cross-cultural experience, that we are quite explicitly trying to, by design, grow beyond our own socially situated, linguistically and culturally situated construct. So we can see some uh, influences which have evolved over a couple of centuries, particularly in Western culture and in subsequently in uh, Japan and other places. Um, there are tensions amongst them, 
and there are some reinforcing elements and uh, many of the major schools of thought or philosophers who explored notions of authenticity uh, were themselves very conflicted, particularly in the tensions between, for example, nationalism and individualism, uh, because people found themselves uh, obviously having very strong individual impulses and trying to find a, a sense of the self where they stood in relation to society but also doing this through the vehicle of their, their language and their, and their cultural reference points, which are an entirely function of the particular place where they happen to have been born, raised, and uh, educated. Um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau is uh, perhaps the first of the uh, um, major Western uh, philosophers, thinkers on um, authenticity. Um, Jean-Jacques had some issues, okay? He grew up uh, fairly poor, family context in Geneva, in Switzerland, but he ended up in France and mixing with aristocratic high society because he, he was obviously a very impressive writer, thinker, um, and yet he stood outside from society there as well, and uh, in some respects he was a very stubborn and um, difficult individual and uh, could have lived a, um, a more affluent life but sought to, uh, to distance himself in certain respects. He was always torn between the, uh, a simple rural life, um, something close to the life of peasants, um, who he would speak of in terms of you know, being like a noble savage, and on the other hand, high society um, with its intellectual, its cultural attainments, but its incredible artifice, in a sense, over-cultured and under-cultured and the tensions between the two. And he himself obviously couldn't make up his own mind. He would be quite contrarian in wearing um, uh, cheap clothes and explicitly kind of standing aside as the uh, st standing apart um, from aristocrats as the um, somewhat eccentric uh, intellectual, um, essentially being true to himself, um, at the same time, uh, clearly benefiting from the uh, attention, the, uh, the recognition uh, that he gained from his well-educated, uh, um, very exclusive audiences. Um, he himself, I think, encapsulates, though, some of the problematic elements of thinking about personal authenticity. Uh, and it, and it's, it's always uh, a fraught issue to look at actually how philosophers live their lives and the personal choices they made. And on the one hand, we should just engage with their, um, with their thoughts um, separately from what we know about how they live their lives. But, it, but it's a difficult thing to do. We know in his case, for example, um, although he celebrated the, uh, the natural instincts, the natural impulses, and, um, the, uh, and, and worried that people, uh, as you said, they were born free, but everywhere in there in chains through their social obligations, he was actually pretty quick to throw, o throw over both social obligations and one would think even natural obligations. Um, he had, I think, five children uh, with his uh, lover who eventually he married but all five of the children were actually given away, put into an orphanage. Um, maybe they uh, cramped his style um, intellectually. Now we see several German scholars in the 19th century um, who explore the tension between um, being part of a uh, language group, German speakers, German educated, um, part of a um, increasingly self-conscious German Volk, uh, folk um, in the context of a rising German nationalism um, in reaction to the uh, Napoleonic Wars. Herder, uh, for example, um, and initially was an admirer of uh, the French Revolution, but then the, uh, the Napoleonic Wars uh, saw the German people um, in German states um, suffering, not just uh, defeats at the hand of uh, Napoleon, um, but uh, Napoleon and the French army meant, did not uphold the, uh, the fine ideals of the, uh, the French Re Revolution and, and the philosophes uh, that in initially had um, drawn so many uh, German intellectuals. And so there was a bit of a uh, reactionary German nationalistic folkish element there. At the same time, he recognised the tension between um, 
being socially situated and embedded and the impulse to individual um, expression, individual character. Because an, another significant part of the intellectual environment with the Romantic movement um, in the uh, late 18th and in early 19th century, um, in uh, particularly Germany, was the, the idea of the free-spirited um, artist or intellectual who would uh, ignore many social obligations and expectations and be true to their artistic impulses, um, even if it um, meant them that they were living quite tragically. Uh, Johann Gottlieb Fichte, in particular, was someone who struggled and explored these questions of self-identity and the self-determining individual and how they stood in relation to their, um, their cultural context, their nation. Uh, later on, the Nazis very much embraced Fick's um, work, um, arguably significantly misrepresented that because he was um, a liberal in, in many respects. But there were a few traces of anti-Semitic remarks and whatnot that he was um, able, uh, that he, he, he was seen to be a precursor of Nazi thought, um, although quite strikingly he was very defensive of the rights of uh, Jewish residents in German states to actually practice their religion, for example. So uh, someone else in the, in, the, uh, in the broader Germanic vein later on, Nietzsche, um, we're often associated him with, uh, um, his, um, with nihilism and whatnot. Nietzsche didn't speak explicitly in terms of um, authenticity, but he did have a very strong sense of how the individual stood in relation to society. And by at least one reading of Nietzsche would say that um, his position was that one should adopt a persona and make it cohere, okay? So that there's a certain arbitrariness in coming up with your own brand story using modern terminology, um, but then become what you say you are, uh, arguably as a Nietzschean perspective. Um, one of the most nuanced in terms of the personal struggle between individual and um, faith and community uh, was Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, author. Um, and uh, so many have seen him as the forerunner of an existentialist concern with this notion of personal uh, uh, authenticity. Um, Martin Heidegger, uh, first of all in the 1930s and then after World War II, very influential German scholar, um, very challenging author to read, uh, but looked explicitly at, uh, in, in, in terms of authentic, authenticity and inauthenticity, when he talk, talks about people living in an in, inauthentic way, though it's not in a completely negative, judgmental way, um, he had a very strong sense that people were um, born, placed in a societal context, but then there was this gradual process of, of, of identity work, of constructing your own self, your own identity. And some people in their identity work, their, their, their identity self-construction, in a sense were more socially derivative, they would be more likely to, em, to embrace um, existing social norms. Others may try and uh, find uh, a more individual mode of living. He argued that there could be critical junctures where people felt a very de deep anxiety um, about the sense of the self and how the social context may not matter and they may have lost a pure sense of self, that they were not living fully authentically. And that um, one thing that could really drive people to think this way was to think about their own mortality that if you're going to die, uh, if you start to think about, my goodness me, I'm, I'm only here for a certain period of time, I'm going to, uh, eventually I'm going to be dead, and as all of this, all of these social contexts, all these social pressures matter, um, have I lost some essential part of me, um, being a people pleaser, now that's certainly, <laughs> that is not the way that um, Heidegger expressed it, um, his, his um, uh, text is, 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 is quite heavy, um, but uh, arguably rewards the, uh, the effort. Um, but Heidegger is another one of these philosophers who it's very difficult um, to unpack uh, critical judgments about how he lived his own life from his work. You can see this particular image here, 
was quite controversial and has been ongoing controversy because you can see um, that he has a small um, Nazi eagle and swastika badge. Um, he had a leadership role in the university and was kind of complicit in cooperating with the Nazi regime, um, even though he had been in a relationship with a, a very famous German Jewish, later famous German Jewish um, uh, author, philosopher, Hanno Rent. She'd been his student, actually. Um, so, um, the existentialist after World War II who had the greatest influence in terms of, of, of thinking about how uh, people have a degree of freedom to make themselves or make something different of themselves despite heavy social constraints was the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, um, influenced by Heidegger. Um, and Sartre had this uh, fairly tough judgmental notion of bad faith that um, s somebody might uh, take on a social role um, and a not particularly, uh, to his mind, accomplished uh, or desirable social role, such as very famously, he was very critical of this particular instance of uh, in his discussion of a waiter um, who seemed so... Um, exaggerated in his devotion to service that he had completely subordinated himself to the identity of of servicing a customer it was really poorly paid um, to the point where the level of his uh, service orientation looked like servitude um, that he made himself a slave to this in some sense and that he was living inauthentically and so I mean this does sound like the privileged intellectual to some degree, looking down on people who um, maybe didn't have the same kind of opportunity to, uh, to have an exp uh, you know, a more self-satisfying expression of one's own identity. Um, many people would argue that there is significant dignity in service, but uh, Sartre's position was partly that um, uh, in a capitalist system, he was quite critical, he was very much influenced by Marxism, but he wasn't a communist per se, um, certainly not. Uh, he was a, uh, a supporter of the Soviet Union or anything, that um, people were free to not cooperate uh, with the roles assigned to them in uh, with capitalism. Again, this sounds like a, a very much a privileged academic um, response. But Sartre, um, arguably precisely because his work is, is so difficult to, uh, to read, that... Um, so many people identified with him and his long-term partner, Jean, uh, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, as uh, these um, champion uh, scholar intellectuals of um, particularly the uh, student um, uh, movement period in the late uh, 1960s, when, for example, Jean-Paul Sartre died, something like 50,000 people attended his um, public funeral. So he was a cult figure not sure how many people actually really fully understood uh, his work, uh, but he lent, uh, through his reputation, great weight to these kind of agonized notion of um, that there is a, a degree of kind of deep angst about how one stands in relation to society and makes yourself and your own identity and whether you're really living a truly or um, an authentic life in a sense of realizing your full um, possibility despite social strictures. So if anyone wants to engage with some of the, uh, the intellectual history of um, thinking about authenticity, here are some very prominent books here. Um, and I've also got a uh, bit of a reading list at the uh, end of the sets of slides. Now, arguably what we saw with Jean-Paul Sartre becoming quite popular um, the uh, parallel in the United States was, you know, the, the hippies in the late 1960s and early 1970s, this idea of throwing, throwing off the, uh, the strictures of capitalism and uh, you know, hierarchical, bureaucratic capitalism and whatnot, um, and living freely, um, although hippies all seemed to kind of dress like each other too, so not sure that people had uh, their own particularly unique style. But certainly the counterculture created plenty of space for minorities to live more freely in some respects, particularly um, uh, 
anyone, racial, racial uh, minorities, uh, sexual preference minorities, for example. Uh, this was the uh, the first era when um, you had a quite a, um, uh, explicit rise in social movements for demand for equal rights, um, decriminalization, for example, of, of gay and lesbian relationships. So there was, um, until the, uh, the late 1960s, a very strong sense that a lot of people were just simply not being true to themselves. You know, that people couldn't simply come out about their sexuality, for example. Um, or if you were African-American, that you were uh, obviously heavily subject, um, subjugated in various ways culturally, um, and to try and win any kind of social acceptance, you had to kind of do it on the cultural terms of others. And so I think we're all, we all understand the, uh, the broader cultural context there, where there was this notion that, um, Clearly, individuals um, were not uh, equally free in terms of being able to pursue their personal projects because of systematic social biases and and whatnot. And um, once that, that, once in a sense, the um, the norms, the dominant culture is is um, challenged then this sends a very powerful message for individuals to try and find their own personal mode of living. Uh, authenticity uh, as a discourse, as a concept, um, is uh, applied in an increasingly wide range of areas. One here, for example, this discussion of authenticity in nature, there's a whole range of interesting issues that arise. Um, when we become environmentally aware of, of human beings impacts on the environment and have a conservation movement what are we to conserve or are we to try and reconstruct um, past environments past ecosystems that have been uh, uh, disturbed by human interventions over time so there are some really quite profound issues on this similarly with heritage conservation what gets preserved what doesn't at, at what historical uh, period um, is considered uh, authentic and therefore other things uh, need not be preserved or maybe gotten out of the way for example and ev even fundamental issues for example of um, how authentic are people's claims to injustice and recent historical injustice and uh, see one of the books we see here up on the, uh, the top left hand side um, looks about narratives of victimhood after World War II, and this is tied up with um, independence movements and uh, other political um, agendas and uh, claims and counterclaims about who's a victim, who, who's, who's, an, uh, who's an aggressive, who was an aggressor, for example, and issues of taking responsibility. And uh, this ends up in a lot of ongoing identity politics as well. So authenticity turns up in a lot of uh, different ways, discussions of the functions of the media. But I think more directly relevant for ourselves is the authenticity boom in terms of an extension of that hippie personal wellness and self-realization thing that we uh, sense there from the late 1960s, that this has been a continuous thread ever since. Um, particularly strong in the United States and other Western countries. Um, but uh, we see here, this is a Japanese author though. Um, 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 in the game of life here, discover your phoenix, activate authenticity and follow life missions. Okay, Authenticity reawakened, the path to owning your life story and fulfilling your purpose. The um, Authenticity Project, that's actually a novel. Um, and this one perhaps will most disconcert you. Authenticity and teacher-student motivational synergy. Okay. Good luck with that. Rightio. Um, some of the other books we see as uh, part of the publishing boom here. The Art of Authenticity, or this one, Authenticity, Building a Brand in an ins um, Insincere Age. Now, this is a common theme in terms of pitching books on authenticity. You say, 
the world's become a really inauthentic place, whether it's because of all these brand um, managers out there who are telling these stories, telling you to buy stuff and buy into stories, um, whether it's because of social media and everyone's curating their own image and uh, uh, authentically inauthentic. Does that make sense? I'm not sure. Maybe it does. Um, but the pitch seems to be um, in an inauthentic age, you can have a point of differentiation or you can escape the trap of inauthenticity by buying their book and learning how to be perfectly um, and personally um, authentic. Okay, so we've got the authenticity principle, how outrageous authenticity um, can be your best sales weapon. Um, or this one here, David Posen, MD, authenticity, a guide to living in harmony with your true self. Listen to your body understand your mind, make better choices in your life. I'd add, listen to your mum, generally. You know, she knows where you're coming from and she kind of hopes that you're going to go somewhere um, good. Now, this title might disconcert you. Certainly, don't worry. Um, I'm not going to take this to heart. Naked at work. You don't want to see that, okay? Um, but this is part of the tackiness of selling books, um, especially in America. You've got to get audience attention. attention. You've got to cut through um, in an inattentive age. This is actually about a leader's guide to fearless authenticity. By the way, you can sell a squillion books um, just by talking about leaders. Most of the people you sell them to are not leaders. Real people who are leaders already are too busy to read books about leadership. Um, it's more people who... Uh, want to be a leader, haven't been able to get a promotion, and then they buy the books about leadership in the hope that somehow it will unlock the inner leader in them and they'll be able to project their leader leaderness or their leader ready, leadership readiness and get promoted. I think there's one here about um, creative authenticity is a, is a probably more meaningful uh, line of inquiry uh, because I think more and more as we uh, are all in some sense creators, digitally empowered, uh, there is the great danger that we just end up doing very derivative stuff, you know, that uh, without reflecting on the sources of our influence, um, we just replicate pretty much what we do, uh, what, what, what we are influenced by, and in a sense culture um, just kind of replicates itself, but in a ever more kind of cluttering up um, compounding the in inattentiveness problem kind of way. Um, one thing I would like to pick up on is, and this is this has been a, a, a theme in the culture for several decades, arguably now. Um, this notion of of really living true to oneself in the sense of um, show a lot of initiative to make the most of every single day. You know, um, squeeze every single drop out of the fruit of life, okay, or suck the, um, suck all the last bit of marrow from the bone of life. Uh, this is, to my mind, the uh, the Dead Poet Society effect. Some of you may know the film with Robin Williams, who plays the school teacher, and the uh, with the uh, the high school boys. Um, and I won't I won't spoil the plot. Um, but Robin Williams over-inspires the students and causes backlash from the parents who just want the kids to study hard and go on to university. And he's this inspiring teacher um, who emphasizes carpe diem, seize the day. Okay, now one of my most uh, interesting and motivated and brightest zemisei I've ever had, Gary, this is his feet. Okay, he had tattooed under the backs of his <laughs> legs, carpe diem. And he came to Sills, he's multilingual, uh, great grades, and didn't do shukatsu, and instead he went off to Bunker Fashion School. Um, and uh, in fact, while he was still a Sills student, so he was double schooling, um, and um, Bunker Fashion School kept him much busier than Sills did, which really had me reflecting as a <laughs> professor in Sills, interestingly. And uh, now he is a uh, fashion designer, and good on him. He's um, very much living true to himself, but certainly without any existential angst, you know, about um, being true to yourself. He uh, was just out there every day um, doing what he felt he was drawn to do, not wasting any opportunities, um, never, never angry, um, always cleverly finessing um, circumstances, doing what he doing what he had to do and doing it well, um, and onwards and upwards to the next big thing. So uh, quite a role model, and um, 
uh, that's all on the feature end there. So um, the authenticity obsession, it's not that everyone has just bought into this. There are some other authors who are um, urging caution. Uh, the most striking one being this, this book that sells quite a lot, uh, The Authenticity Hoax. Uh, there's an interesting book here. This is the, from the cover on the left-hand side, Simon Feldman, a philosopher, uh, Against Authenticity, Why You Shouldn't Be Yourself. And his argument, it's, it's quite a sophisticated argument, but uh, part of the argument is just simply, um, if you're just saying, just be true to yourself. Well, you're probably not a good enough person to warrant that. <laughs> and the point is that... Um, uh, we should all be trying to be better versions of ourselves. Only the very good and uh, the very reasonable who are very caring individuals um, should feel content to be themselves. And he touches on a broader point that um, so many of the people who, who are quickest to buy into notions of personal authenticity and pushing back against any kind of social constraints are actually pretty self-centered individuals. That there's a lot of the me, 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 and not much about you and your authenticity kind of thing. So focused on their own personal projects and resistant to anything that gets in the way. So there is a great danger that people will use and abuse the personal authenticity narrative to license their own selfishness. Um, I think one of the most nuanced books around that strikes a real balance in terms of surveying the intellectual context traces through the 19th century and, for example, has a very good discussion of Nietzsche and others, um, but also a very, very balanced and accessible uh, discussion of you know, how to have a, uh, or how, how we might have a meaningful notion of authenticity and personal authenticity. Um, is this book by Charles uh, Guignon on being authentic. That said, um, there's an endless supply of books that uh, are much more in the kind of the self-help vein, some of them dressing themselves up in, in um, very philosophical terms. This one here, oh, this guy's got a PhD too. Um, there you go, got a PhD, well... How to Live Authentically in an Inauthentic Age, The Existentialist Survival Guide. Okay, great. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of others, which um, are, yeah, pretty crappy. Um, uh, Awakening to Authenticity Collection. You've even got the whole sunset and sunset thing and um, the meditational thing. Don't Trade Your Authenticity for Approval. Um, mask Off. Unlocking Authenticity in an Age of Imposters. I think this the uh, the Kindle version of this book actually is selling for free at the moment on Amazon. Um, I'm not sure what the conclusion is from that. Okay. And Authenticity to Agility. Being agile, by the way, is another fatty term at the moment. Um, so, should we fake it till you make it? Okay. Um, there is tension here. If, and there really, it really is quite a profound tension, if society is just telling us what to do and what to be, but that's not really us, we should be looking to grow beyond that personally, and we should aspire to that. And one way to, in a sense, discipline yourself to escape the strictures of society is to set yourself a goal um, and work hard to do that, uh, to be the authentic you. So maybe declaring yourself to be something that you're not yet, but which you want to be in a strongly aspirational way, in a kind of a lock-in way, in a Nietzschean sense of pick a persona and then become it, um, that uh, starts to get rather close to fake it till you make it, perhaps, okay? There are some other books here which say, hey, don't fake it till you make it, okay? Um, and this Authenticity Code is another one just coming out. Someone else has piled in on this. The Art and Science of Success and Why You Can't Fake It to Make It. Okay. Um, I haven't read it yet. I don't know. But my inclination is to say, try and be it. Okay. But have a bit, be a bit aspirational as well. Uh, of course, something we'll talk about too. The key to creating an authentic personal brand. Um, finally, just to take us back to where we started... Uh, with the uh, curating design and authentic stories. Now, this is actually quite separate from issues of authenticity, but often uh, is co-located in uh, communicative space, shall I say, uh, these days. 
It's very common, as we saw in the beginning here, uh, to have curation, curation, uh, craft, the artisanal and authentic, all just kind of mashed up together, okay? We will unpick some of this in the class discussion, and uh, Adam Johns will have a lot to say on this because there's these are all aspects, key aspects of his research. Uh, we can say just simply that there is a strong curatorial turn in the culture to the point that where we ask questions, well, does everyone, is everyone a curator these days? But does, you know, does that mean, you know, I shop, I curate? Does that actually mean very much? The emphasis on craftsmanship and the artisanal will be an interesting thing to explore. One argument is with the ubiquity of high quality mass production much of it offshored, for example, there is uh, a degree of uh, anonymity uh, with our products. So uh, distance, we, we don't get a sense of the human dimension in the sense the product, uh, it all looks too good and too easy. So we actually like to see the traces of the human within it, whether that's actually just narratives about um, the, uh, the designer, for example, because we're we're pretty content with the standardized mass-produced product from Apple, but uh, we, we know the Apple story and seem to be accepting of that, okay? So maybe it is more about narratives about um, per, that personify the, uh, in, in some way. Um, and there are some pretty severe tensions um, between, on the one hand, celebrating creativity, and maybe all of us being creators now, that's another question, um, while at the same time talking about authentic and things being authentic and craving the authentic. Because for example, we can think of the continuation of traditional artisanal techniques and product forms um, as central to something being authentic. Um, and that may imply actual resistance to significant change associated with being creative. So that's an open conversation. Is everyone a curator? We've touched on this. Is everyone a creator? Well, Shopping and then posting a picture of your shopping online, in some sense you've created content, but it's at a pretty banal level, okay? Um, that said though, I think it is very meaningful to speak of creators and huge numbers of creators, active bloggers, YouTubers, TikTokers, empowered by digital platforms. And uh, many of them are finding their own very distinctive voices. And uh, I think we uh, can say that many Many young people are good at discerning authentic voices through social media platforms um, when people are at least culturally kind of close to them um, in, the, in the sense that you do have, you, you, you do intuitively kind of know when people are uh, spectacularly faking it, okay? Um, but uh, more generally, how much can people grow? A lot of it actually comes as cre creators. A lot of it comes back to how extensive and intensive is your cultural capital, how much you've actually got to work with. Um, and then that raises a whole bunch of interesting issues about indebtedness to those cultural sources. And um, is something uh, genuinely creative? Is it original? Um, that's a separate set of issues from authenticity. Uh, but we go full circle because this takes, takes us back to those deep philosophical discussions that those um, German scholars were engaged in uh, about where the individual stands trying to find their own mode of living and expression while being uh, thoroughly culturally situated uh, and linguistically situated. And uh, the, everyone is of their time and place and to try and act otherwise would be strikingly inauthentic in some sense, but also to find your own um, particular voice, particular mode of expression.